27 ways on how you can negotiate your construction projects better. There's a big issue in the commercial construction industry. There's people that are closing one out of 10 or one out of 20 projects. And to me, that's freaking ridiculous. You should be closing 20, 30, 50% of your bids if you understand the process. And guess what? In this video, there's 27 different tactics, strategies, and methods that I use to close millions and millions of dollars of projects every single year for my clients. And guess what? Number 27 is my secret weapon. So if you wanna know what is fully responsible for the multi tens or hundreds of millions of dollars a year that we do for our clients, number 27 is the one. So stay tuned. Number one, professionalize your proposals. Listen, the number one thing you can do is professionalize and use a professional proposal template in your proposals. And it's not just proposals, but it's branding in general. Like we're talking about negotiating, but a lot of these tips are gonna be about preparing the way for your negotiation. Because a lot of times these new clients, they're gonna get their first impression through the proposal you send. Or if you're listening to my advice on all my other videos, you're gonna go visit clients and you're gonna pass by their office, you're gonna wear your embroidered shirt with a nice logo and you're gonna dress the part. You can't dress like a worker with the boots, you have to dress like a million dollar business owner. Number two, bid only for clients that give you attention. Listen, I've been in the game long enough to know that your potential clients already know who they wanna do the job. Uh, if I'm a GC, I already know who I want for my drywall, for my framing, for my paint work, for my concrete. I already know who I want to use. So I'm going to put those people as a preference. So in order to start working with these guys, you got to break in. And a good indication of if you're able to break in with them is going to be if they give you attention. So a lot of times you're going to bid jobs and you're going to call them and you're going to follow up and you're going to email them and they're, you're going to, they're going to go ghost. They're not going to respond to your emails. They're not going to respond to your phone calls. They're not going to call you back. And that's a good indication that they have zero interest in you. So let me tell you something. If you implement what I call our unlimited lead system, which is where you get a lot of leads in the door, you never have to beg for anybody's attention. You just go find the owners and the GCs and the architecture firms that want your bid, that want to work with you, and those are the guys that you focus your attention on. Number three, bid only for clients who are good salespeople. Let me tell you something. I hear every single day from my clients, oh, I only want to bid jobs that they won the job. Oh, I don't want to, I don't want to waste my time bidding because I don't even know if they're going to get the job. And the truth is that's a valid concern. If I'm a subcontractor or even if I'm a GC and my developer may not get through the financing, or if I'm a subcontractor and I'm bidding for a specific GC, they got to win the job first in order to give me the job. So point number three is align yourselves with clients that are good at sales because the last thing you want to do is invest, 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 and them not even win the job to be able to give it to you. Number four, set up your negotiations with consistent follow-up. Listen, one of the biggest killers of projects is not following up. And if you're in construction, you're probably busy. You're probably really good at the construction side of the industry. But when it comes to the sales and the systems, you probably don't even have time to do this. So, but let me tell you something more important than the price of your proposal is going to be in your follow-up because the follow-up is going to set up the negotiating and there's two things that are going to happen number one you're going to build relationships with these new clients and number two you're going to keep updated you're going to keep your finger on the pulse on what's going on with the job so what does that mean think of it like when you go to the hospital or if there's a surgery what do they usually do they connect you with all these sensors so they can check your blood pressure they can check your your uh, heart rate they can check your vitals and you're basically going to be doing the same thing with these projects. So our follow-up strategy is you call every three weeks so that you can get an update on the job. And for a long time, what's gonna happen is they're gonna say, uh, nothing yet, we haven't heard back from the owner, we haven't gotten the permit yet, we haven't gotten the financing yet. For a long time, you're gonna hear that. So you just expect it. Don't think you're gonna get a job in a month or two, not in commercial construction. You're gonna, it's gonna take sometimes several months, but when the job hits, it's gonna hit. So for example, you're gonna call every three weeks and then you're gonna start getting signs of like, oh, we're having more meetings with the owner. Oh, we're having a job site walkthrough. Oh, look, here's a scope of work. Can you confirm your price? So when they start giving you those indicators, those are indicators of interest that they're gonna want you to do the job because they're starting to give you that inside information. So what you do is they're getting close and what you do is you switch to following up every three days because what happens is in every three day window, there's a chance that if they get the contract, you're gonna be there available to call the project manager or to call the owner or to call the owner's rep to be present during the negotiating. Because what happens is these guys get the proposals from their estimators and then they're like, all right, who's the cheapest or who's the second you know, lowest bidder. All right, we're going to go with that number. All right, let's call. And then a lot of these PMs, they have the guys that they want to work with. So they'll use the low bidder 
for negotiating. They might use your number to negotiate for some other guy. By you submitting an estimate, you've literally handed the job on a silver platter to your competitor if you don't follow up. And then when you find out who the project manager is, then you're gonna do what I call the hard close. And we're gonna cover that number 17. Stay watching. Number five. Activate the mere exposure effect. In psychology, there's this principle called the mere exposure effect where scientists have studied and they've observed through social dynamics that whenever you have more touch points, and this is kind of like a marketing thing, whenever you have multiple touch points, which is a phone call, an email, a visit, uh, a text message, any sort of connection with them, that's building familiarity. And coming from, I don't know, maybe it's the primal days or who knows, but built into our subconscious is we're gonna like and trust people that we are more familiar with. So you probably have had those scenarios where you've met somebody or you've seen them at like holiday parties where you see them once a year and you're like, hey, yeah, nice to meet you. Or, or like maybe you meet them once and then the next time you see them, you're like, hey man, it's been a while. How's everything? How's the family? How's the kids? Boom. And then you don't see them for like a year and then you see them again, like a year later. Or maybe if you go visit or if you go to your supplier, you just talk to the guy every single time you go, you're building familiarity. And what happens is you might not know anything about him. You might not even know his name, but what happens is you're building that familiarity which makes them like and trust you. By activating the mere exposure effect, you're gonna open the doors to things like inside information. They're gonna tell you who's getting the job. They're gonna give you secret information that may not be available to the general uh, public of where the status of the job is that you can use during your negotiating. Number six, treat your bids like preliminary proposals because the truth is they are. Like the other day I did a project for one of my clients. We submitted it to the GC, we did the follow-ups and I already knew that when it comes time to buy out the job, they always change everything. So I submitted my proposal, we, we sent the estimate, we sent it over, and then after weeks of follow-up, when I finally got to talk with a project manager, she tells me, oh, change this, change that, the deck height is not, is not 10 feet anymore, it's 11 feet. Oh, we're, gonna, we're not gonna knock this, this wall down, we're gonna change this, 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 this. Because what happens is projects are not real projects and estimators, sorry estimators, but most estimators, especially the GC estimators, they don't really know how to estimate. They are just glorified proposal getters. They're just secretaries basically, where they get the bids and they get proposals and they just check to make sure everything's in there, put it in a spreadsheet, boom, and that's their job. But then when the package gets to, to the project manager, when it gets to the me, I'm gonna look at it and I'm gonna say, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, he's missing this, 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 we need to rent a scissor lift because we're gonna have multiple trades working, boom, 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 and it becomes a real thing. So the project managers start changing things. And also there's considerations to the value engineering where sometimes the projects come over budget and they're trying to reduce the cost, they're working with the owner because obviously the GC has his client, which is the owner. So things like that make your bid a preliminary. Even if your proposal was perfect, any competent GC is gonna ask you for a discount. And they're gonna use the words, oh, your price is 20% too high. Let's sharpen our pencil on this, Daniel. Oh, we're actually kind of over budget on this one. Let's see what we can do with the bid. Hey, Daniel, if you lower your price, I can actually uh, give you more jobs out of this. So they always use like their own, their own little negotiating tactics on you, the same way that we're using it on them. So just know that whatever you submit is like a preliminary. They're gonna negotiate it down later anyway. They're either gonna remove scope or change it, or they're gonna beat down your price. Number seven, submit a budgetary bid if you're short on time. Now listen, there are times that they're gonna call you on a Monday to submit a bid for that Wednesday. And you have 14 meetings and 97 job walkthroughs and a thousand other things to do that you don't have the time. So considering point number six, that knowing that this is a preliminary proposal anyway, go ahead and submit a budgetary bid where you're pretty close. Get on the negotiating table, get in front of them, and later you'll, you're probably gonna have the opportunity to negotiate that job, maybe adjust the scope, maybe uh, qualify a bunch of stuff in your proposal, like I bid it like this, I bid it like this, based on this, based on $2 a square foot, whatever it is, make sure you qualify it all so that they know what the proposal is based on. The only guarantee of you losing a job is by never bidding it. So make sure you get them your bid, even if it's a budgetary bid. Number eight, always ask, what other projects do you have coming up? and set up your next negotiation. Now, a lot of negotiating, I don't know if you've caught on, but it's setting up the way to negotiate. So it's not just negotiating, it's you're literally preparing the way, you're, you're rolling out the red carpet so that when the time comes, your negotiating is more effective. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, the, the owners and the GCs are gonna hire you based on your price, your relationships, or your reputation. And what you wanna do is you wanna increase your perceived value by doing all these little tips and strategies that we're sharing here to increase your perceived value so when the time comes to talk to a GC or to talk to the project manager or to the architecture firm or to the owner's rep, whoever's hiring you, the way has been prepared. Number nine, filter your clients and only work with the best. Listen, in order to do this, you gotta get a lot of clients, a lot of 
potential leads in the door. If you're just bidding like two or three jobs and you're getting a few opportunities here and there, you're not maximizing your opportunity. You're not gonna be able to have leverage in your negotiating. If you're bidding 30 jobs a month, for example, um, I was doing $7 million a year bidding 30 and 40 jobs a month and when I was in commercial drywall. So if you're bidding 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 jobs, what's gonna happen is if one job doesn't hit, Hey, it doesn't matter off to the next one the next one doesn't hit hey it's okay off to the next one so the jobs that i'm getting are premium rates and i don't give that persona that feeling of like oh this guy's desperate so a lot of times they're not going to give you the job because they think you're a little guy and you're desperate but by having a lot of options you give that that subconscious communication of i don't really need this job i want this job so and then it kind of puts you almost like in a play, level playing field with your client uh especially if you're a sub going to a gc all right now let me ask you real quick before we continue what is your best negotiating tactic go ahead and put it in the comments below and i'm gonna actually respond to you number 10 make sure your bid is accurate make sure it's not too high and it's not too low a lot of times if you're too high you're going to shoot yourself out of the running because they're not even going to consider you because they think your bid is way out of the ballpark uh, if you're too low it's the same thing uh, i know a lot of gcs that will literally uh, let's say you have prices of like i don't know 200,000, right one guy's at 200 another guy's at 205 another guy's at 190 we kind of know where the range is but if you come in at like 120 you know what that's going to tell me oof this guy messed up his bid he missed something important he doesn't know what he's doing and then in their mind it's a reflection of how you're going to be a contractor on the job oh this guy's probably going to make a mistake he's going to walk off the job we're going to have issues so i think i'm not going to consider him for this job make sure your bid is within the ballpark you want to shoot for number two you don't want to necessarily be the low bidder but you want to be like the number two bidder number 11 the break even method this is like one of the things that i invented like literally nobody does this um there's this process that when i was in commercial drywall it was like cutthroat sometimes a lot of competition and I started thinking about it and, I, and on every single job that I've ever gotten, I've always made between 10 and 30% in change orders. Not that I overdo the change orders, it's just like a natural progression of the project. That's just how it is. So what I would do is we started bidding the jobs almost at break even or very, with a very small margin, which would make us the low bidder. And remember earlier I talked about that in order to win a project, they're gonna judge you based on your price, your relationship or your reputation. Well, if I don't know these guys, I have no reputation and I have no relationship with them, so they can only go by my price. So in order to build a relationship and to build a reputation, I have to break in. So we're gonna break in with a new client at cost or slightly just above cost. Because I know that either way, I'm gonna make up some money in change orders. That's just how it is. So I'm not gonna be too concerned with my bid price. I have a client of mine that he won a thirty, like a $35,000 bid and while he's on the job, the GC starts telling him, oh, look, can you paint all these other rooms? Oh, can you remove this acoustical ceiling and replace it with framing and drywall? Oh, can you take off the carpet for me? So totally another $17,000 in change orders, which if you've been in the industry, you know change orders, you're, you're gonna charge premium rates. You're not gonna charge you know, the same as your bid. You're gonna charge premium rates. So this guy's gonna make more money in the change order than his actual bid. So when you combine that, he came in low, won the bid, boom, he's gonna bank on the back end. So this is like sales 101. Sometimes if you go to any retail store, a lot of times they're gonna bring you in with the deal of the week. And then you're gonna end up getting the warranty and all this other stuff, and you're gonna end up making more money on the back end. So we have to think like business people. We can't just think like contractors where we wanna squeeze every penny on the bid. We have to come in low, win the bid, build the relationship. It's gonna give you a fighting chance so that you can wanna become eventually their preferred contractor once you build this reputation and the relationship with them. Number 12, use the prospect farming method to become a preferred contractor. So prospect farming is all about filtering prospects and giving them priority every step of the way so in the first stage we're gonna research a bunch of clients and we're gonna see we're gonna start bidding for them so we call that stage zero then in stage one we're gonna go and we're gonna see like what is our gut feeling telling us are they gonna be a good client do I like the company culture do I like these guys so we're gonna kind of start filtering like who do we want to bid for because at the end of the day if you only have time to bid five or ten or twenty jobs a month you have to allocate your resources to the best possible clients then eventually after you start bidding five to ten jobs with each client you're gonna go back and filter and analyze based on actual data you're gonna go back and say like all right out of all these jobs I bid for this client how many did they win and how many did they give me because obviously they have to win the job and then you're gonna start making decisions based on two factors the first factor is are they a good salesperson and we talked about that in one of the points earlier if they're a good salesperson you want to stick with them because they're gonna sell more jobs that they can give you and number two out of those jobs that they hit how many did they give you? Because if they're not giving you work, even when they win it, then there's no point in bidding for them. And then what you do is you have what I call a come to Jesus talk. You show up to their office and you say, hey, listen, we've bid 10 jobs for you and we haven't got anything. Like, what are we gonna do here? Because I'm not gonna bid for free. 
I'm gonna be your free estimator. Then they're gonna be like, oh look, I got this job, we just got it. Like, you want this like small scope? I, I can start you off here because I've never worked with you before. Something like that. Then what happens is after you knock it out of the park, you eventually will do so much work for them that you're building this reputation and relationship with them that you're eventually gonna become what, what I call a preferred contractor where they're giving you 60 to 70% of their bids because they've worked with you already for a while. Number 13, consider future revenue. When you're going into bid, this is gonna allow you to go lower on your price, especially when it's a new client. So in the break even method, we're using our opportunity to come in and make up some money in change order. So that change order is additional revenue. Now, if you know beyond the shadow of doubt that you're gonna get more work from these guys or you're gonna get change order, that's gonna allow you to adjust your price and bid lower. It's gonna make you more competitive and it's gonna get you onto more negotiating tables. Number 14, bid for projects whose bid date has already passed. Look, you can go onto like the Blue Book or Dodge or Construct Connect or any of those platforms and they're gonna publish the jobs that already bid in the past. A lot of those jobs are still good because they may have already gone to bid, but if you call them up and you're like, hey, I wanna put in a bid, they're like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And sometimes you kind of skip the waiting period and in other times you go straight into negotiating because they might already have their bids and they're winning the job or maybe they're doing a cost plus contract and they're just like, hey, listen, I already got a bid. I got a price of 200 you know, for this trade. What can you do? Oh, I can do 190. Okay, here you go, boom. And that's a way that you can kind of skip the process. Number 15, bid for projects that are awarded or in the negotiated stage. So this is kind of like number 14 where you're going to jobs in the past and whenever they say awarded or a lot of times the owners, they know the GC they're gonna use and they're just gonna award them off the on the front end so they don't have to go through the typical bidding process. So if the, the little thing says awarded on Construct Connect or on the Blue Book, those should become priority to you. Number 16, create a priority list of your clients. Listen, not every client is made equal. When I was in my drywall company, we used to get so many bid invites and I used to get phone calls from the GECs like, like, oh, you're gonna put in a bid, I need it, ah, like emergency, everything was an emergency. I don't know why everything in construction is always an emergency. So they would call me and my estimator was like really bad at like prioritizing. So any, whoever screamed the loudest, that's the person that would get the attention. And that's not how you can do business. You have to work with schedules and you have to prioritize. So what I did was I created a priority list of like one to five. Our VIP clients that are giving us work and that are giving us repeat work, that's number one. If they call, we stop what we're doing and we bid for them because we know we're probably gonna get the job. Then the next one is like the people that give us a few jobs a year. Then the next one is like, if we have time to do this, we'll work with these guys. So we had a priority list that we would put the people in. So when you start bidding for the same people, you're gonna start needing to do that. Number 17, hard close your client. Listen, if you've been doing all the stuff that we've been talking about here, you're gonna get to a point where if you've been following up and you're keeping your finger on the pulse and you're talking to the clients and you're visiting them and you're like keeping updated with the job, there's gonna be a point where the project manager is gonna get assigned the job and boom, now it's time to negotiate. So if you're a sub, you're gonna look for the PM of the GC company, of the general construction company. If you are a general contractor, sometimes it's the architect, he'll have his own project manager or sometimes there's an owner's rep, but somebody is the one that makes the decision. So you gotta find out who that is. So what you do is you call them up, number one, you make sure do you have the most updated proposal. So sometimes there's revisions and things, make sure they got the right proposal. And number two, ask them what their numbers are. Just be direct. That's why it's called hard closing. So they don't want to give you the number before you bid in case you can come in cheaper. But once you bid, then they're like, all right, you submitted a bid of 200,000. Well, I got 190, I got another one of 180, and I got another one of 225. You came in at 208. What can you do with that price? Boom, and now we start, we go back to our estimating department, we go look and we start adjusting the numbers and tweaking, can I cut off my profit a little bit, my contingency, my equipment, maybe I don't need two scissors lift, maybe I just need one. So you start tweaking the numbers and trying to see because now you have a target. Now you actually have a target of where to aim at. When you're bidding the job, there's always like an uncertainty where you're like, am I, am I too high, am I too low? I don't know, did I, miss, did I get everything? Did I miss anything? Like, there's always uncertainty and everybody has that same uncertainty. So don't worry, it's not just you. Everybody's gonna have that uncertainty. And when they give you the real numbers, now you have certainty and now you have tools that you can work with. And this is contingent on all the work that you did before with your follow-up. So that's why it's important that you do all of your follow-up very, very, very efficiently. Number 18, use your relationships to get inside information. Look, when I was in commercial drywall, we used to go visit clients all the time, and this is by far the number one way to get inside information. This company called RCC, they're a national GC. I'll go visit them with my boss, and every single time, since we had a great relationship with the estimating department, we would go there and they would sit down with us and they're like, all right, let's open up your bids. Let's see where we are. Let's look at the numbers. Oh, you're kind of high on this one. You're kind of low on this one. Number one, it's going to give me market data. So I'm going to know where the market is. A lot of times we don't know where our bids need to be because we don't have market data. Like they don't publish it. So you have to ask for it. And most of you guys are probably busy and don't ask for it. The number two, it's going to give you inside information. Like one time 
they want a project and the estimator tells me hey listen on monday michael is going to be buying out the job you should call him like at nine in the morning boom no, nobody else knew that so i called michael at nine in the morning negotiated the job i did my hard close method from number 17 and boom we won the job this is why you got to use your relationships to your benefit so what do you think so far click that like button and make sure you subscribe to get notified every time we release another video we're on a mission to help contractors grow their business all right moving on number 19 visit clients to get information that you can't get over the phone all right so there's a part of us as human beings that we rely on nonverbal communication and if you look up any sales training and any sales anything a lot of it is in your relationship and earlier i talked about the mere exposure effect i talked about building relationships about inside information so a lot of these tips they kind of like overlap a lot of times you're gonna call it's, it's a temptation to just call or email like i have a lot of clients that i'm like we're bidding jobs and then they don't win and i'm like I'm like, oh, how, how many times have you visited them? Oh, I haven't visited them. Oh, how many times have you called them? Oh, I haven't called them. Like my secretary, she emails for an update. I'm like, dude, you're not gonna get any results like that because you need to visit them. You need to, like, like if you're gonna go buy, you're asking them to give you hundreds of thousands of dollars of a contract, but they don't even know what you look like. So go visit your clients. And all you gotta do is this. You stop by five minutes, you open the door and you say, hey, I was in the area. I wanted to meet your estimating team really quick. I'm bidding a few jobs for you guys. I have a meeting coming up in five minutes, so I want to stop by super quick. Or make sure you use the word really fast, quick, five minutes, because those guys don't want you to linger and save for 45 minutes talking to them. Quick meeting, shake hands, all that stuff. Like the little small talk is really where you're going to get a lot of traction with these guys. Number 20, make sure your bid is apples to apples with your competitors. A lot of times you're going to submit bids and the, the pri your price is going to be too high or it's going to be too low. And oftentimes it's because the other guy doesn't have a good bid or maybe you don't have a good bid, but either way, make sure that what you're proposing is the same as everybody else. The way you do it is during your follow-ups and your visits, if they're telling you that you're 20% too high or they're telling you that you're the high bidder or vice versa, maybe you're too low or the low bidder, make sure that you go over the scope of work with them because they may not be comparing apples to apples. And that leads me to number 21, submit any unclear items as alternates and take them out of your main price. So a lot of times when you submit a proposal, there's gonna be things that are unclear, that you're not 100% sure about because there's no time to submit an RFI or there's allowances that you're gonna put or there's like additional things that maybe you don't wanna carry that scope. For example, I'll give you one. one. A lot of my clients will do the framing and the drywall, but they don't wanna do the installation. And then I have other clients that they wanna do the whole package. So if it's unclear how the GC wants the bid, remember these guys are getting 80 bids per project, like three per trade times, you know, there's a lot of bids coming in. So make it easy for them. You put your lowest price on their proposal and then you can put like a line item for insulation, which is a separate price. So that's one way to do it. If there's alternates, make sure your alternates are in a separate price, not on the main bid. Number 22, negotiate your pricing with your vendors. So a lot of times if it's neck and neck and you're negotiating and it looks like your price needs to get lower, oftentimes it's a simple phone call to your supplier where you literally grab the phone and you're like, hey, um, we're about to win the job. Can you give me a little bit of a discount so we can get the, the advantage? And then what happens is your supplier wants you to win the job as much as you do. So they might give you that little extra few thousand bucks discount if it's gonna help you. Number 23, negotiate your prices with your subs. Listen, if you're working with the same subs, you need to be starting to get wholesale pricing at a certain point because you're getting giving them work over and over and over. So this goes for, if you're a subcontractor, you likely have your piece workers or your sub subs that do work for you. And if you're a GC, you're gonna have your subcontractors that do work for you. You should be getting better pricing as you give them more work. Number 24, offer budget estimates in the early stages of projects a lot of times when the projects are in the design or the planning stages you offer valuable insight almost like a consultant i have a friend of mine that he's a general contractor and he goes out to architecture firms and he literally just does this all the time hey we you know what projects are you working on we offer consulting services for free in exchange for the best shot to win the job or at other times they'll literally negotiate the contract just from this consulting that they're doing for free because if you're giving input from the beginning and you're catching like the other day he sends he shows me that the architect put a ceiling height of nine feet but their storefronts are at 11 and they didn't have a detail for their motorized window shades so he came in and he basically saved them from a massive change order because when that goes to bid nobody's going to put that little pocket detail in there but then when it goes to when they're in the project, then that's gonna be prime time change order time. So when it gets into the project, that's gonna become a massive change order. So he was able to do that. So guess what is the law of reciprocity. The architecture firm is gonna say, hey, I wanna give you the job because you helped me out. 
or at least give them the best shot for it. Number 25, help your client make more money. <laughs> it sounds simple, but your clients are out to make money the same way you are. So if you can align with them and you can help them and you can team up with them and you can figure out a way to help them advance their project or save money on their project or do something in a different way that's gonna cut costs. So for example, I had a project that we were doing, they had, the architect has specified this like super expensive like FRP. It was like crazy expensive, sealed with heat, with no seams and all that. And I called up the architect and I'm like, hey, why are we doing this? Oh no, because it looks nice. And I'm like, well, listen, I talked to my supplier and they have the exact same product, but that just has these little trims in between like FRP normally does. And it looks almost the same. And it's 75% cheaper. I submitted the sample, I submitted the cut sheets and they're like, all right, boom, let's do it. So I think I saved on that job like 20 or $30,000 because it was the whole back of house area that was getting this FRP. Number 26, let your clients buy the materials. A lot of times when you're gonna be handling the materials and placing your order, you gotta consider things like your time to pick it up, making the material list. You have to consider the financing aspect of it. You have to pay up front or you have to pay interest whenever you put it on your credit line or your credit card. So these are things that you have, these are costs that you have to pass on to your client. So I've had many cases where, especially with, with subcontractors, where I've told them, hey, listen, call you up your GC or call up your developer and tell them, listen, let me do the labor only and I'll prepare your material list and everything and I'll set everything up for you, but you pay the materials directly. What happens is, they're gonna save money, you're still gonna do the same work, and the liability is also on them, so it's like a win-win. They're liable for the material, you don't have to worry about it, it's not an issue to you, you'll do the same thing that you're normally doing, but they're gonna save money because you're not marking up another 10, 20, 30% on that material. Now, obviously, you wanna make that 30% on the material, however, sometimes when you're negotiating, these are little tactics and strategies that you can use during the negotiation. And last but not least, my favorite tactic, my number one method to win projects. This is literally responsible for probably hundreds of millions of dollars worth over my whole career of winning projects for me, projects for other companies I've worked with, and projects for my clients. It's called bidding packages. Now, I didn't invent this strategy. This is not something, it's kind of like I picked up on it and I started like trying it and like I've refined the process. So there are times like, uh, let's say I'm a framing and drywall contractor. I'll use my own experience. We used to bid framing and drywall and insulation, right? That was the package. But then years, you know, sometime later, we started like, hey, why don't we bid the paint? We're already doing the drywall. We might as well just subcontract the paint, boom. Oh, why don't we just do the doors? Why don't we just do the trim? So we started bidding interiors packages, boom. And what I found was that the GCs loved it because they're gonna have a single source for multiple trades. So instead of having 15 trades on a job, we reduced that by half because now we're basically doing all the interiors and you're gonna make more money on your contracts. And they're gonna be happy because you're gonna be able to have more leverage to give them discounts during your negotiating. So it's like everybody wins with packages. So how do you do it? You submit your proposal. This is as a subcontractor. So this is like a tip for like the subs. You submit your proposal and you break it down by trade like the general contractor's gonna ask you for. My framing is this, my drywall is this, my insulation is this, my painting is this, my flooring is this, right? But in each item, you have to put supervision, overhead, and profit, right? Now, what I do is I have like a little secret that I'm gonna share with you. On the bottom of my proposals, in big, bold, red letters, I put, if multiple trades are awarded, a significant discount will be provided. So one time I was doing this and I called up the GC to follow up and the, and the project manager says, hey Daniel, it looks like you put in this note about a discount. Like, what's that discount? And I'm like, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so basically the project manager started telling me like, this is my framing number, this is my drywall number, this is my paint number. So like the project manager showed his hand and I'm like, I'm like, now I know what my targets are. So I go back to my estimate. I'm like, oh, I can shave this. I can shave that. I don't need so much supervision because a lot of that supervision overlaps. I don't need so much overhead. I could cut my profit. Because if you're coming in with, let's say each trade on average is about, let's say 30 or 40 grand, right? But combined, you have 300,000 in trades. You have money to play with there. So you can literally say, all right, if you, Mr. GC, if you get all these trades separately, then you're going to pay this much. But if you do it all with me, not only are you going to save money because I'm going to give you this whole package for, and then you give them like some crazy discount, like 20% off, which is thousands and thousands of dollars. And you're going to be able to have a better sequence because I'm going to use my own guys. And there's one set of billings for all this stuff, rather than having to worry about five pay applications, five superintendents, five project managers, five this, five that, five checks. You don't have to worry about that. And then they, they, they love that stuff. Like that's the way. Now, these tactics that I've just covered, all 27, these are some of my very best stuff. And if you want the very, very best, then you need to sign up for my Contractor Sales Academy. So I created a program that is designed to take you from 
wherever you are today to a million dollars, then $5 million, then eventually $10 million. And it's called our eight figure contractor sales Academy. All right, I'm going to put a link in the description below so you can sign up. We're giving a 30 day trial so you can try it risk free, cancel anytime. So go ahead and check it out and you're going to get A to Z, how to grow your construction business, leads, estimating, negotiating, everything. So this, what you got here is the tip of the iceberg. So I look forward to helping you grow your construction business.